The leadership and participation of women and girls is key to effective gender equality measures and the tackling of climate change. The European Climate Pact will strive for gender balance amongst its ambassadors and will foster the diffusion of science-based information about the social and gender equality aspects of climate change. The EU-funded forest law enforcement, governance and trade facility is a concrete initiative through which the EU promotes the involvement of women in the agreement signed between the EU and timber producing partner countries. For instance, in Liberia, 300 women participate to the process from the local to national level. Some are now beginning to assume leadership positions in forest governance structures. This means women will have a say in deciding how to distribute the benefits of commercial forestry among local communities. Another example is the Euroclima Plus program in Latin America, which supports capacity building in relation to climate change, ensuring the participation and consultation of women. Increasing women's representation in decision making has been a priority for the Commission for many years. And as we've already heard now, 10 years after the tabling of a proposal for the Directive on Improving Gender Balance on Corporate Boards, and thanks to the support of, of Germany, uh, member states are now moving forward towards its adoption. So this debate, feeding the Commission on the Status of Women, is a real opportunity to call on governments for commitments to promote gender transformative policies and women's empowerment in climate change. Women and girls must be agents of change and drivers of sustainable solutions. Let us build a world of equality. I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Helena Dali, the uh, Commissioner for Equality of the European Union. Thank you for, for those words. Um, we've already heard about, or we've heard from Juliane Rosin, who is a representative of civil society. She, she is a Deutsche Frauenrat, right? And uh, so and that they're, they're hosting the W7 this year, right? In the context of G, uh, Germany's G7 presidency. Um, and so, We'd like to highlight a little bit more what Women7, W7 actually does. And to do that, to help us understand how they work and how they feed in the ideas that they generate and the demands that they have into the political decision-making process, uh, Deutsche Frauenrat has prepared a short video for us that explains their work and explains what they do. And we'd like to show you that video now. Hey G7, this is the global gender gap. Did you know that it will take us another 135 years to bridge it? That the pandemic has set us back by a generation in closing this gap? That marginalized women and girls in the global south are most vulnerable to the impacts of the climate crisis, even though they have contributed the least to the problem? We need to turn this phase of crisis into a phase of change. This phase of change needs all of our faces, all of our voices, and we are ready to face it. So, are you ready? We are the W7, a joint force of representatives of gender equality organizations and advocacy groups. Our goal is to bring gender justice into focus within the G7. Our demands will be poured into a final declaration and we hand it over to the presidency. So join us and become a face of change. For more than 45 years, the G7 has represented an informal forum of the formerly most powerful economic nations of the global north. The G7 is not just this one summit, it is a long process with an influential outcome. 
the G7 communique. So let's face it, women in all their diversity need to be wherever decisions are being made, represented. Together, we create a gender equitable way out of the crisis. W7, time to face the change, time to bridge the gap and get over it. Thank you for that, uh, Deutsche Frauenrat, for that short video, for highlighting again what the D uh, W7 is, what they do, and how important their work is. I think that made it clear, and, and of course the clear demand that you posted at the end. Thank you so much. Uh, now, we're ready for the discussion. I'd like to introduce you, I promised it earlier, I'd like to introduce to you our distinguished panelists that I'm so happy to have. Um, and so happy that you're here today and that you could make time. I'll start right next uh, to me on my left, Ms. Anita Patia. And um, so she's the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and the Deputy Executive Director of UN Women, where she is responsible for UN coordination, partnerships, resources, and sustainability. Ms. Patia, thank you so much for finding the time today. I'm sure you have a very busy, busy schedule, but I'm glad you're here and I'm glad um, you're here with us today. Now, next to Next to Ms. Patia is um, Alexandria Villasenor. Thank you for, for being here. Ms. Villasenor is an adamant activist for climate, uh, or in the fight against climate change, I should say. Um, and you were inspired by Greta Thunberg, right? And um, I, I would say you're Greta Thunberg's equivalent in the United States, more or less. And, uh, and I'm, I'm so glad you're here. And you're also the co-founder of US, US Youth Climate Strike and uh, the founder of Earth Uprising. And uh, thank you so much for, for coming here, and I'm very glad um, to have you, and we're looking forward to, you know, your point of view from the activist side of things. And uh, of course, last but definitely not least, <laughs> um, I'd like to welcome Ms. Spokme Ahmed. She is a senior global policy advocate at the International Center for Research on Women, or ICRW, here in New York, and she provides policy analysis and advocacy leadership uh, in, multi in multilateral spaces, including the United Nations, the G7, the G20, and among other responsibilities, uh, she also manages ICRW's signature feminist UN campaign and all associated publications. I'm very glad to have you and uh, to talk with you about the institutional side of things and what, you know, what ideas you have to improve that part. Now, I'd like to jump right into the discussion, right? And that's, I'd like to start with you, Ms. Padilla, right? So um, the, the topic of today's discussion is, of course, women's empowerment and leadership in the context of climate change. And so my question, my first question to you is, sounds simple, but probably hard to answer, how do we do that? Um, what, <laughs> what policies do we have to pursue? Now, you're the Deputy Executive Director um, of UN Women and the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, so you know these international institutions inside out and so what do you think what do we what do we have to change on an institutional level in order for women to play a bigger role here when it comes to fighting climate change well thank you very much bastien and good morning everyone let me just first start by saying how happy i am that un women is at the table with all these young people so i feel young um, and uh, also really just to say a very big thank you to the federal republic of germany to Japan, uh, the EU, and the National Council of German Women's Organizations for organizing today's important discussion. And I'd be remiss if I didn't start by just saying, as we're talking about women, we need to take a minute to just reflect on how privileged we are as women here, able to sit and have a conversation while lots of women in many parts of the world are struggling um, we see the pictures on television of Ukrainian women, but they are just the last uh, and the most recent evidence of how whenever there is conflict, it is the women and the girls who are always the most affected. So I really did want to just take a minute to reflect on our privilege and the fact that it is a stroke of luck that we are here and they are there. Um, And then I'd like to answer your really easy question on what can we do to change the face of leadership? That's how I interpret your question. Of course, this is something UN Women cares deeply about because we 
have done reviews of how far the world has progressed since Beijing. And when we did our review, we found that 26 years after the Beijing platform, lots of things had changed that made gender equality more promising and more attainable. So we saw lots of improvements in access to education. We saw lots of improvements in maternal mortality. We saw improvements in access to education. And we did see improvements in representation. But let's remember the baseline was really low. So some factoids that I really want all of you to remember walking out of this room is that you know, women are still only 25% of parliamentarians, less than 10% of heads of state. We had the first CE female CEO on Wall Street just two years ago in 2022, in 2020. And so we are a very long way from seeing anything like equitable representation. What can we do? First of all, governments have to recognize this is a problem and newly elected prime ministers and presidents have to make super heroic efforts to ensure that they have gender equal cabinets. Out of the 193 member states of the United Nations, less than 20 have gender equal cabinets today in 2022. Second, we need directives. Uh, Commissioner Dali just talked about the directive on women's representation in boards. This is something that has been languishing for 10 years, which means the political will was not there. So thank you, Germany and the EU, for pushing that through. Finally, we need this to be a global phenomenon. Number three, we need to change biases, attitudes, and stereotypes. Because what happens is formation of attitudes takes place in the first six years of a, of a child's life. So family units have to role model women's equality. And this has become extremely difficult during the pandemic because the care burden for women shot up during the pandemic. It was three times the care burden of men even before the pandemic. But what happened during the pandemic? All of the burden of schoolwork, homework, of children who were not able to go to school fell on women. So I really worry about the fact that you're going to have a generation of kids growing up who are thinking, mommy's job is to stay at home and do all the homework. Daddy goes out to earn the bacon. And so these stereotypes have to be affected. The advertising industry has a very important role to play in ensuring that we are not creating the wrong stereotypes, and finally, this is not something that can be done by governments alone. This requires a whole of society approach. Government has a role to play. The private sector has a role to play by appointing women, by recruiting talent, mentoring them, uh, promoting women into leadership positions. Uh, the fact, as the PGA said yesterday, we've never had a single female secretary general tells us how far we still have to go in women's leadership. So this requires political will, it requires leadership in the private sector, and it requi requires institutions like UN Women in partnership with civil society to keep talking about this until we no longer have to. Thank you. So, still. Still a long way to go. Um, I'd like to come to you, Ms. Villasenor, because you are basically the, um, you embody the change, right? Like, because you're, you're young, you're a young woman, you, um, you're basically who we're talking about today because, because you're the generation that will be most affected by the effects or in the consequences of climate change and you've taken a leadership role in the fight against climate change. And so you're now among, now today you're here and we have the ministers here and we have like uh, all these important people and you're among these decision makers a, a lot and, and I wonder what is the sense that you're getting when you have the demands that you're making, when you talk to these people, are they listening? Or what do you think has to change um, in order for women like you, young leaders like you, to actually affect change? 
Uh, well, thank you for that question, and also thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, I first want to kind of talk a little bit about um, the context of how I got involved in activism. I joined the youth climate movement about three years ago when I was 13, so I'm 16 now. And at the time, I got very heavily involved with the Fridays for Future movement. I started striking in December of 2018 right down the street uh, at the bench in front of the United Nations headquarters, and I ended up striking there every Friday up until the beginning of the pandemic, but I joined this movement of youth from all around the world, and we organized protests, and even now the movement is growing and changing, especially as we are being faced with different climate catastrophes catastrophes every single day. So youth are adapting our movement to what is happening all around the world. And so one thing though that I noticed when I got involved in activism was that the youth climate movement was being led by young women and girls from all around the world. And so I'd be asked quite a lot, well, why is it? Why is it that girls are leading the climate movement? And that is because it was mentioned in the video too that youth, uh, young women and girls are one of the most affected by the climate crisis, even though they contributed the least to it. And so women are the caretakers all around the world of our home. They're the peacemakers. They're, they're the mothers of our earth. And so young girls, since we're feeling this so much, that makes us feel so much more motivated. And young women and girls are also one of the first to create the solutions for the climate crisis as well. And so I think that one of the main things is that we need to, first of all, educate young women and girls. One of the, uh, one of the best solutions for the climate crisis is educating young girls all around the world. And when you do that, it's not, it's not only educating them, but also empowering them because once they're educated they feel more empowered to go out and take action and so once they do that then they uh, can get in those decision-making rooms and tell world leaders exactly what we want to see and so it's also making space for young women and girls in these rooms and of course however being from the youth climate movement if the space is not made I will say we will make the space for ourselves <laughs> And then not just that, but also um, amplifying one, uh, one another, amplifying young women and girls on social media by amplifying us, by connecting us with others and those in positions of power, business leaders, because we bring different ideas and solutions, especially as young people, because we think outside of the box that a lot of adults have been, uh, a lot of adu adults have been ingrained in the way that our society works. But youth kind of see outside of this, and we don't think about what is politically possible, but we think about what we have to do in order to get change. And so young girls, uh, young women and girls bring different ideas and solutions to the table. So educate, empower, and include us in the conversation, or we will make that space for ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank that is a very powerful and very confident statement, and I, I really appreciate that. And I, w I would like to um, come to Ms. Ahmed, because, because you, you analyze policies in these multilateral institutions. And I, I would like to ask you, now from an institutional point of view, Ms. Villasenor said, we're gonna make this space for ourselves, right? From an institutional point of view, uh, what do you think? Is there, what are the possibilities for, for women, like for young leaders like Ms. Villasenor to actually have the chance to make that space? Or what do we need to change within those institutions? What do you think? To, to give them a better chance to actually be heard and to actually have the space that they require. Uh, thank you so much for the question and the introduction and thank you to the hosts and, uh, and organizers. It's great to be on this panel with you both as well and to learn from your expertise. Um, I think what you've highlighted is really one of the most important parts of climate and gender justice. We've seen time and again that, as so many speakers have pointed out, that systemic discrimination is amplified in times of disaster and climate crises. So women, LGBTQIA plus populations, communities of color, and other vulnerable groups are often most marginalized by disaster and disaster response. So we really need to ensure that representatives of these impacts 
impacted communities are central to key leadership and decision-making processes. So they should be integrated in brainstorming sessions and planning sessions and steering committees and also as part of delegations to key conferences like the Commission on the Status of Women. So I think those governments like Germany, like the United States that prioritize civil society engagement as part of their delegations and encourage them to do the same for other UN conferences and events. Um, in multilateral settings like the G7 and the G20, it's amazing for governments to engage with other stakeholder groups like the W7 and the Civil Society 7. And we also encourage governments to not just engage with civil society at the global level, but to make sure that this engagement extends to their country level engagement so that when they're in those global summits, they know exactly which recommendations to carry forward at the global level to better conditions for women, girls, and other marginalized marginalized groups within their own countries. Um, I also want to highlight that climate justice is linked to so many other issues that affect the lives of women and girls, including sexual and reproductive health and rights, for example. The climate crisis disrupts access to SRHR, especially for groups that face additional barriers like race, disability, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Um, extreme weather can cause displacement, it can lead to other issues like gender-based violence, child and early forced marriage, um, exposure to other health conditions like HIV. So I think it's important for us to recognize all these interlinkages and to bring that to the multilateral setting as well. Um, like my pan fellow panelists ha um, highlighted, care jobs are green jobs, so investment in the care economy is essential and there should be linkages between climate justice and economic empowerment in these multilateral settings as well. As we've seen in the COVID-19 pandemic, um, care, the reliance on care is really amplified in these crisis moments, and to bring that to, to decision-making spaces is essential. So women, girls, mar marginalized communities have the solutions to the climate crisis. I think what, like what my, um, what Anita highlighted already is that we really need political will. Governments need to acknowledge women and girls and civil society organizations working on these issues, bring them to the table, and most importantly, to make sure that they are properly funded and that investment is going directly to grassroots movements, to feminist organizations working on the ground. Um, so it's time to not just treat women and girls as subjects, but as equal partners in decision making. Thank you very much. <clears throat> You said, it, you said it requires political will, uh, will and, you, and you said it too, and we do have political decision makers here, and at this point I'd like to bring in um, Baroness Stedman Scott, because I do believe that you uh, need to be at a, another appointment later on, so um, I'd like to bring you in now. Uh, she is the UK Minister for Women, and uh, you have a statement and maybe even a question for us. Well, good morning, oh, Hold on, you're going to get a microphone. Oh, so. Sorry. Yes. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be invited to speak today on such an important topic. Uh, women, girls, and marginalized people are both disproportionately impacted by climate change and often excluded from decision-making practices around climate change. That is why we need the voices of women, girls as leaders, and agents of change in climate policies. The UK remains committed to using our COP presidency to advance gender equality and social inclusion in climate change action and finance, including through strengthening implementation of the UNFCCC Gender Action Plan. We are determined to ensure that the equality agenda is driven by evidence, an important issue covered at this event. As part of our commitments under the Generation Equalities Forum Action Coalition on Feminist Action for Climate Justice, the UK committed to strengthen the collection and use of data on gender inclusion and climate. This includes working towards disaggregation, UK international climate finance, people indicators by gender, age, disability and geography, as well as strengthening analysis and use of this data to understand the inclusivity of UK ICF and inf inform future programming. The UK Office of National Statistics has begun a five-year project to develop global harmonised standards 
and methods for reporting on the health impacts of climate change, which will promote disaggregation of data by gender and other equalities characteristics as an integral part of statistical reporting. We're also working to build the evidence base on gender equality and climate change, such as women's empowerment in the energy sector and the wider green economy. And on data more broadly, in the context of the G7, we are, I am pleased to say, to be also working with Germany in their G7 presidency and the OECD developing a new monitoring and accountability mechanism for gender equality to improve transparency and accountability in the G7. I am pleased that Germany, as G7 presidency, is driving this forward. Now, I'm really looking forward to hearing from other speakers during this session, although, as uh, the, the chair there said, I do have to leave to go to another, uh, another event, but I will make sure um, I'm informed of the further contributions. And as I've said nearly in every session I've been involved in, I'm looking forward to working with other people, uh, learning best practice, because as far as I'm concerned, none of us are as clever as all of us. Thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Baroness Stenman Scott, for, for that, and definitely something to keep in mind. You did mention the G7, and I would like to um, pass that on to you. So the, the G7, of course, is an informal forum, right, in the country, for countries of the global north. Now, we've heard like, that you know, Germany is chairing the G7 this year, and, and I would like to know, or I would like to ask you, what role should the G7 play in promoting women's leadership in the context of climate change and, and also what initiatives, because we heard um, of course a German chair this year, what initiatives could Germany advance during its presidency to promote women's empowerment in the context of climate change? Well, first of all, the G7 should look different. You know, when you look at that picture, we just saw a picture, this was an old picture, there was Angela Merkel and many men. So I think, first of all, the G7 needs to do better in having more m women at, you know, and this, of course, is a question of, you know, citizens need to vote in more women into power, but then the structural barriers to women being in positions of power needs to be removed so we can see more women at the decision-making table. So that's the first thing. The second, I think, is that you know the G7 has to really mainstream gender into everything it does. So yes, there is a Gender Equality Advisory Council. UN Women has been very engaged in that and will continue to be engaged in that. But that is still just an advisory council. The real issue is, is the G7 communique that comes out at the end of the G7 meeting got gender running right through it and is gender mainstreamed into every policy discussion? And I think we are a long way from that because we really need to put gender at the heart of finance because finance is not yet gender responsive enough. And by that I mean public finance as well as private finance needs to have a gender lens. And the G7 ministers can make that happen. Last year, um, when Italy was uh, president uh, of the G20, it had a meeting for the first time of the gender equality ministers as part of its uh, presidency. Now, this is something that I think is a very good step. It should be continued. But really, to me, the heart of this is going to be is gender front and center as a policy consideration in everything else that the G7 is discussing. I remember looking at the paper that Professor Nick Stern had put together just before uh, the G7 uh, in the UK. And I said to Nick, I said, who just happened to be somebody I know, and said, there isn't much on women in this at all. You know, and this is great, it's a great paper, but where's gender? And you know, the fact is that a lot of extremely well-intentioned scholarship, research, and policy work remains gender blind. So what can Germany do? I'm really happy to see the G7 presidency of Germany is pushing in a big way on the care economy. I think this is 
critical because we at UN Women have been talking about the care economy for decades, but this kind of fell on deaf ears. It did not rise to a major public policy concern until the pandemic hit. And when the pandemic hit and policymakers saw that female labor force participation was declining dangerously in some countries, such that in many countries you now have a situation where you have lost women from the labor force, these women may never go back to the labor force, you will have structural inequities being baked into these systems. So as a result, I think policymakers suddenly woke up and said, gosh, Care economy is a real issue. So I'm really pleased that Germany is pushing this. The other thing that I, we have been discussing actually with Germany as it's in its G7 presidency role is this issue of gender finance. When you look at how much money was spent by countries in their fiscal stimulus packages after the pandemic, countries spent $11 trillion. How much of this money went to women? We need to start measuring that, and we need to say public and private finance needs to be more gender-friendly. You know, money is always a discussion for the boys. It now needs to be a discussion where finance is front and center driving gender equality, because in the end, you can have policies, but you have to implement them. And when you implement them, you need money, whether public or private. And if that money is not gender friendly, we will not see change. So one of the things that we would like to propose to Germany is that it consider how SDG bonds and sustainable development bonds, which respond to the interest by investors in having more of a focus on environmental, social, and governance issues uh, really focuses on gender. And sorry, Bastian, to take so long on this, but I just want to say, we've seen in the last year in 2021 a huge increase in the number of countries and corporates who are pushing gender bonds. Mexico in December 2020 issued an SDG bond. There was not a word on gender in this bond. Italy issued a huge green bond. Was there a gender lens in it? No. So, you know, the world of sovereign issuances needs to take gender into account, and so do private issuers. This is something UN Women is working on, and we'd be very happy to support Germany as well as Japan, who will be the next G7 president in, in pursuing a gender lens in finance. Thank you. So gender policies, gender, gender policies and, and gender issues still not being represented enough in the G7, as you're saying. So Ms. Ahmed, you advise the, the process, right? The G7 process you, with, with, w, with W7, Women7, in, in that dialogue to feed in those re requests, those demands of, of having more of those gender policies you know, go across the board when, when it comes to all, all fields of, of politics. So can you tell us a little bit about that dialogue and, and, and what you're doing to make that more of an issue in, in all fields? Absolutely. So I'm so pleased to be a part of the W7 this year. So with major thanks to my colleagues at the National Council for Women's Organizations for their incredible planning and facilitation of that process. Um, so the W7 advisors this year from all around the world, not just G7 countries, are focusing on six key issue areas. We're focusing on economic empowerment and equitable COVID-19 recovery, gender-based violence, feminist foreign policy, climate justice, and also accountability. So as the video in the beginning laid out, we're in the process of developing our key recommendations under each of these issue areas, and we'll be releasing a final declaration that will urge G7 leaders and other stakeholders to endorse as they go about their decision making and in an effort to mainstream gender throughout the entire G7 agenda. Uh, so I want to take this opportunity to amplify some of the climate justice recommendations that my colleagues of the W7 process have been pulling together. So first and foremost, um, going off of Anita's comments to climate finance. So we really want to direct funding to, directly to women and to women's rights organizations. It's most important when we talk about leadership and decision making, we need grassroots women's rights organizations to have funding and for that funding to be flexible and for it to be sustainable. Um, 
Um, also, redressing loss and damage through financing is an important part of climate justice. Recognizing the linkages of gender, health, climate, and other issues. And also redirecting money from military and carceral systems directly to a just and equitable transition. Um, other recommendations they also focus on include focusing on climate migration and understanding the linkages between climate and displacement. Since a lot of, since displacement via climate can amplify a lot of other risks like loss of education, livelihoods, access to health, including sexual and reproductive health and rights. Um, endorsing again my recommendation about care work and investment in the care economy. Um, enabling the participation of young women, as other panelists have pointed out, and also, most importantly, ensuring that we have gender and sex disaggregated data that also recognizes on other demographic information, such as race. Um, it's most important to have data to understand the effects of climate on all these various populations. Um, I also sit with the Feminist Foreign Policy Working Group as part of the W7 process, so I want to amplify our recommendation that G7 countries all adopt feminist foreign policies. Some G7 members already have, including Canada, including France, and most recently the German government. So we were really pleased to see that announcement come out as the W7 process was underway. So climate is so essential to foreign policy decision making. Foreign policy decisions affect climate conditions. They directly affect women. So. Uh, we want 100% of climate financing to address gender issues, and we want to see this mainstreamed throughout foreign policy decision making. So happy to talk more about that later on, but just want to amplify that recommendation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to, I'd like to go to you, Ms. Uh, Senor, because we just, we just heard that the G7 is still very much male-dominated in, in many ways, and that gender issues aren't really aren't really being, you know, they're not front and center as they should be, right? And, but on the grassroots level, it, it's, very, it's very different. And you said it earlier, that is very much dominated by young women, just such as yourself, right? And so I was wondering, how far does that go from your experience? Right? Like, um, somewhere along the line, the, you know, it must thin out because uh, we have all these young, engaged, and, 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 and powerful female leaders such as yourself on the grassroots level, level and then going up somewhere they disappear so from from your from your perspective how far does that go and what can you do what do you think what what resistance do you encounter to make that space that you said before that you were willing to fight for um, if, if it's not being provided to you well I think a lot of what you were talking what has been discussed um, it, it's more of an issue of uh, accountability. And when I think of accountability, that is where I mainly see a lot of youth and young women and girls in the climate movement, is our accountability when it comes to making sure that um, the G7 and uh, conferences like COP are inclusive of young women and girls. And so that's where youth really get involved, is making sure that our world leaders and those in positions of power are doing the right thing and are making sure that people that need to be in those discussions are there. And so I was actually at COP25 and COP26, and I noticed that there was a big issue when it came to inclusion, and especially uh, inclusion from young women and girls from those communities that are most marginalized and impacted by the climate crisis. We needed more representation from uh, indigenous communities and communities from the global south. And so I already see people having conversations about COP27 now, and the fact that we've had 27 is just insane in general, but I think that youth are really pushing even more to make sure that we have inclusion in, in those conferences. And so making sure that delegations have inclusive voices as well, making sure that there's people from every single community, because if we keep having the same conversations dominated by the same voices, then we're not going to get the solutions and conversations that we really need to get action on the climate crisis. And so it's really making sure that youth hold those in positions of power accountable for what they're doing, having more inclusive voices. But also, I'm noticing that there's a lot of youth who are um, getting involved in the decision-making process from the outside. What I mean by that is there's a lot of youth who are starting to write policy and resolutions, and they're going to their local communities and 
they're proposing these resolutions and uh, pushing for them to get acted upon. And so I think that that's another way that we're doing it is we're still trying to engage the system from outside of it. I think that deserves a round of applause. I think, <laughs> thank you very much. And so like, it's definitely the energy from your side is definitely there and now requires a change of mindset from those at, in those decision-making positions to, to give you that access and to hear you and, and to, to make that happen what you demand, right? And I'd like to bring in, um, I'd like to bring in um, Ms. Elena Bonetti from Italy. She is uh, the Minister for Family and Equal Opportunity and I'm glad to have you with us today as well. And uh, you have prepared some, some comments for us and, and maybe even a question. So, please. Thank you. Dear colleagues and distinguished delegates, in our societies today we are called individually and collectively to face very complex challenges affecting our lives, well-being and economic development in a coherent and a balanced way to preserve and, where possible, to prevent the deterioration of the environment, the negative impact of climate change disasters of natural and anthropogenic origin. In this context, women and girls can play a proactive role. They can determine a change of pace by applying their skills and expanding their knowledge, especially technical one, their real and effective participation in decision-making processes. They can be true agents of change for present and future generations. Let me recall three interconnected teams people, planet, prosperity, at the core of the agenda of the Italian G20 presidency last year. In this framework, the promotion of gender equality and women's empowerment has been more than relevant. Each person contributes to the development of individual and collective well-being, is responsible for the preservation of the ecosystem without borders, contributes to the economic and social growth of his, her country, and at the same time of the global community. In this context, I organized for the first time a ministerial conference on women's empowerment, introducing the gender component also along with the environmental perspective. The final chair statement of the G20 leaders explicitly includes a reference to the need to increase the inclusion of women in leadership position and in decision-making processes of policies related to the env env environmental and sustainable development, which also encompass the different effects that env environmental factors and climate change have on the female population. Empowerment, in fact, rests on the strengthening and enhancement of female talents in the labor market in both public and private sectors. This knowledge will undoubtedly prove useful in facing challenges posed by environmental sustainability and the need to launch zero-impact ecological transition processes by women and girls employed in green professional sectors. We are all called upon to renew our commitment to promote the gender perspective in the development of technologies for energy transition, environmental protection and the fight against climate change, and similarly, equal opportunities must be guaranteed in the energy sector, also recognizing the essential role of access to energy in the development processes. This is unquestionably important now more than ever to define the roadmap towards a sustainable, equitable, inclusive, and resilient post-pandemic recovery in the long term. In this perspective, Italy National Recovery and Resilient Plan addresses gender inequalities in a cross-cutting manner. It will be used to ensure a level playing field in the labor market, close the gender pay gap, and increase the number of women in leadership positions, including the presence of women in the political arena. The plan draft, uh, according to the use of the Next Generation EU funds, has identified the ecological transition as one of, it, of its main objectives. The, color, the Italian government is committed to design environmental and sustainability policies also in response to climate change, taking into consideration the gender lens as well as skills and knowledge of female technical professionals. We cannot ignore the alarm signals about the condition of our planet today. 
It is crucial that we all work to ensure that environmental protection, economic growth, and our well-being can be common goals to be achieved jointly and rapidly. To this goal, to this aim, we need the crucial, the essential contribution role by women and for all women and girls and with all women and girls. So thank you very much. Minister. Minister Elena Bonetti, thank you very much for, for those remarks. We also have uh, another minister with us from France, um, Delphine O, uh, ambassador, or ambassador, I'm sorry, ambassador for, um, for gender equality and secretary general for the Generation Equality Forum. And uh, you have some remarks that you have prepared for us and um, we're very much looking forward to hear those. Thank you for upgrading my position. Not yet a minister, but I'm here on behalf of uh, French Minister for Gender Equality, Ms. Elisabeth Moreno, who sends her regrets. Uh, Mesdames les ministres, Madame la Commissaire, first of all, special thanks to the G7 German Presidency for organizing this event on the occasion of the 66th Commission on the Status of Women. I think some of the questions that were asked to this panel, what are the key components of a gender transformative strategy related to the climate crisis? The three components, some of them were already tackled by the panel, are the following, according to us. Political will, I think this has been raised by the three panelists. As the German proverb says, wo ein Wille ist, ist auch ein Weg. It's been a long time since I was a Germanistic student in the Freie Universität. The subject of climate change is of course complex because it requires reconciling the short time of instant political action with the long time of action on climate change. Political will, if isolated, is not enough. It has to be teamwork, and this is really pretty much what we want to stress. This is why multilateralism is essential to reconcile the different political and factual agendas. The SDGs, of course, the different COPs, the Paris Agreement, they all complement each other. And the role of the G7 uh, is of particular importance for continuous sake. Um, I would like to remind the audience of the different initiatives that were launched at the French G7 presidency back in 2019. Um, of course, uh, this, there was this um, gender responsive environmental action and training, so-called great initiative, which was signed by the ministers of environment of the group of the seven in Metz, in the uh, Ville of Metz in May 2019. But there were also a number of initiatives that were launched for gender equality, as my friend Anita would know. Um, under the, uh, the patronage of the Gender Equality Council, um, the Biarritz Partnership for Gender Equality, the AFAWA Partnership with the African Development Bank, uh, the Mukwege Murad uh, Global Survivors for, for uh, Survivors of Sexual vi uh, Violence in Conflict. So France is very mobilized on the nexus between gender and climate change, two key, pri two key priorities for a country. The second component is to center women, and this again has been said by different panelists. We all agree that due to structural inequalities and gender stereotypes, women and girls are disproportionately affected by the impacts of climate change, but they are also not by destination the only the, the victims of climate change. They do have the capacity, the knowledge, and the power to be the leading agents of adaptation and mitigation. So gender mainstreaming is key here so that women can be fully involved in all areas of society and levels of decision. And would like, as friends, to thank once again Commissioner Helena Deli, I think she has left, for her work and commitment to mainstreaming gender equality inside all EU institutions. And last but not least, as our friend at UN Women know, the role of civil society is essential and of paramount importance. This is how we worked at the Generation Equality Forum, of which uh, Germany was an important member, which was organized by France and, UN, and Mexico in partnership with UN Women. In July of last year, 2021, we launched six action coalition that gather around the same table, member states, international organizations, and civil society organizations together with the private sector. One of these action coalition tackles specifically feminist uh, climate justice. The Generation Equality Forum was the biggest and the most important summit, international summit for gender equality. We managed to raise $40 billion to further advance gender equality in a multi-stakeholders format that is definitely a model that we should replicate. 
I would also like to recall the creation in 2019, as part of our presidency of the G7, of a 120 million euros fund to support feminist organizations from the global south, and this has also been said. The support fund for feminist organizations is managed by our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, our uh, Agence Française de Développement, and is specifically tackling gender and climate issues. So as um, a former uh, G7 uh, president and in the long lineage of the Canadian presidency, the French presidency, the British presidency, I'm not gonna comment on the American presidency, um, we'd like to offer our support and help and contribution to the German G7 presidency and the High Council for Gender Equality. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Delfino, for that. Now, we talked about civil society earlier and, and how important civil society is for these changes and in the fight against climate change. And I'm happy to welcome Susan O'Malley, who is with us today. And, and she is uh, from the NGO CSW. And there she is. I see you behind the. <laughs> okay, there you are in the I'm, corner. I'm also, um, my NGO is International Federation of Business and Professional Women. That's done very um, nice work in Germany, particularly around equal pay. Anyway, I, I'm honored to be here. It, yeah, maybe I'll come out a little bit. Um, <laughs> um, it's a little bit daunting because the, the, um, all that you've said, is, it's been so wonderful. This has been a wonderful session. Anyway, so I represent NGO CSW, um, and the chair, Hori Gudelekin, is with the SG at the, um, uh, at the town hall. I'm the immediate past chair of NGO CSW um, and um, also the co-chair of the Ad Advocacy Research Committee. I also want to say we've had a wonderful partnership with UN Women this year and also with the Bureau. Um, it's been a much better year this year in CSW than last year. Um, I want to say just a bit about the Advocacy Research Committee where seven NGO CSWs in the regions, plus Geneva and Vienna, because that's the history of the UN. Um, and we, we work on, um, on, on, the, on, on the priority theme. We started working on the priority theme, believe it or not, last July. We <laughs> and it was so wonderful to be a global group because we would have these meetings and we would lay out, I would lay out things and, and then I would get educated by the Global South or, or whoever was there to say, but think about this. And it was really, really good to do this. We also had fun. Um, I want to first thank the German mission because when I was chair, you gave us a grant that helped us to develop our advo advocacy training in negotiations and women's human rights. It's on our website. And believe it or not, it's in Arabic, English, French, Spanish, and Russian. I also want to thank Ambassador Sauter, who met with us in October before he left the mission. We had asked him how we could be more effective in the outcome document. I'd been doing it for a number of years, and I thought we were just totally not effective. So what to do? So we lined up the Bureau and some of our friends, and we said, how can we be more effective? And they told us in no uncertain words. And they said, why do you get out your recommendations in February? That's ridiculous. So Ambassador Souter said, you get them to us in December. I said, okay. He said, no long documents. Don't you understand? Some of the missions have two people, and the English is not their first language. What are you doing to them? He said, three recommendations. Make them very clear, very concise. Um, I liked, I mentioned this, we did meet with, um, I always meet with Ireland, being an O'Malley or whatever. Um, and <laughs> so uh, Geraldine said to me, and don't you poke. But I liked it. We had a wonderful meeting with the U.S. <laughs> mission last week, and they said, I think you should poke some more. So uh, we're getting a good balance between, you know, diplomacy and poking. Um, so we did exactly what um, Ambassador Souter said. Um, and we, um, we sent them out in, um, in December. We sent it out to the SG, 
and he responded. That was exciting. And then <laughs> we sent it out to the Bureau, oh, to UN Women. And they actually said they liked it. That was a wonderful, wonderful email response from your the civil society section. And then we sent it out to the Bureau, uh, the chair and the Bureau, and then we sent it to all the member states. And we got some good, good, good re replies. We did send out six recommendations. How can you be confined to three? Um, and they are on our website. Then in um, later, in, um, let's see, it was in February, we sent them out again, and we added negotiating briefs, just with precedent language, with um, evidence, with good practices. If Kenya can have a really good education program in the elementary schools on the climate crisis, oh, the rest of you could do it too. Also included was um, legal and policy frameworks. So. Two of our recommendations were um, or are included in the concept note um, for, this, um, for this meeting. One, of course, is women's participation. Where can we get? Um, we had this Vienna Cafe. You know, we got um, uh, what NGO, CS do, uh, N NGO CSW do, is doing. It has a platform in which we bring um, uh, ambassadors or people working on um, CSW. We bring them with um, NGOs from around the world, and then we talk about um, the, the, um, the outcome document, and it's been wonderfully effective. But one person was saying to me, well, what is effective women's leadership? How many? I thought, oh my goodness. Well, first get us at the table, and then maybe half, maybe a little bit more. Um, so uh, you have in your um, concept note uh, women's participation in decision making and addressing the green and just transformation. You also have one in education and training for women and climate resilient jobs, and that was another one of our recommendations. As I was writing this last night, suddenly what appeared in my mailbox, my email box, Rev1, whoa. I could barely put it down. I, <laughs> I think it's quite a good document. I was amazed at all that is included in this document. May it survive. I do think Germany, <laughs> as the lead negotiator, probably has a bit to do with how good this is. Um, there's an excellent section on migration and climate change in the document. Um, I have been getting pushback on our, um, on our recommendation on migration, um, and particularly also on the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration that's mentioned. But I noticed that you mentioned it, or in the Rev 1, it's mentioned, and, and, th and that's exciting. You know what else we had in that recommendation? Oh, I shouldn't move. You know, I'm a professor for many years, <laughs> but an, a Shakespeare professor. So I got, so, um, you know, <laughs> all right, I'll stop moving. All right. Um, Let's see, where was I? What we had in, in our um, migration um, recommendation was disaggregated data on displaced people, displaced women and girls. How on earth can we ever um, ha have decent policy if we don't have dis I'll stop moving. disaggregated data? Um, and there was some pushback in that, too. There's also a section on finance in, the, um, in your Rev 1 that I thought was good. It could be even stronger. We got pushback on our recommendation on that. They didn't like we, when we talked about the Global South and the Global North, and that maybe we should pay attention to debt reduction in the Global South so that they could attend to, um, uh, to issues of the climate crisis. Um, uh, they didn't like the word reparations, that, that's not a word that, um, but anyway, I'm learning. Um, your, um, your Rev1 pays attention to small island states, yes. And I also like the way you change language in interesting ways. Just one example, gender responsive becomes gender transformation. Isn't that nice? It's not just responding. How about transforming? Okay, let me get to my question. Why isn't there more attention being paid to women and girls and farming? 
in discussions of the priority theme for CSW 66 and, and the outcome document. It is estimated women are 43% of the agricultural labor force, but fewer than 25% are landowners. Shouldn't the lack of ownership, land ownership, and problems with inheritance for women, particularly widows, be a topic of concern for CSW 66? Women farmers are extremely vulnerable. It, and you can look in CEDAR, of course it's in CEDAR, and it's in the Bayesian Platform for Action. So that's, that's my question. I just want a little, little nod to the wonderful widow's resolution that was passed yesterday in the General Assembly. I found it that it was quite a, mi a milestone. Um, anyway, so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan O'Malley, for, for your remarks and for your question as well. And I think I'd like to pass that. I'd like to pass that question on to you, Ms. Patia. Maybe uh, you can jump on that and have something to say. Well, I, I mean, I agree with you on the importance of um, women farmers. When you just think, if you just visualize two subsistence farmers, say in the Sahel, you know, one's male, one's female. One won't have access to land, one won't have a title, one will be taking care of the children, what, you know, they're just completely different lives. Um, so, but how much play it gets is a process of negotiation and, you know, I think, I, here I actually want to take the opportunity to thank the ambassador for her leadership because I think the way the negotiations are going this year, I mean, we're not there yet, but I think it has a great deal with the fact that it's you. So thank you so much for that. And um, <laughs> and hopefully in the final version, there will be more attention paid to this, but I'm really not in a position to comment on the final outcome document till the negotiations are over. Ms. Ahmed, you, you were speaking before about finances and, and how important that, of course, is because in the end it all comes down to money. And, and so I'd like to ask you, um, what can be done uh, within, within the, the G7 and, and within these uh, dialogues? What can be done uh, to make sure that the money actually gets to these projects and gets to the women? And, and, and Ms. O'Malley mentioned data, and I'm sure that's an important factor, too, to know exactly where that money should be going, and it's important to, to know who those people are. So I don't know if you could say something to that and, and what can be done to improve that. Sure, absolutely. And thank you, Susan, for your comments. As a member of the Women's Rights Caucus, really appreciate uh, everything you mentioned about the agreed conclusions and the need for gender transformative commitments. So thanks for that. Um, on financing specifically, I really want to reiterate my points about investing directly in women's rights organizations and ensuring that that funding is flexible and that it's sustainable, that it's long term, so that we're making sure that feminist organizations have the agency that they need to guarantee solutions and to carry out the advocacy moving forward. Um, also urging governments to invest in existing mechanisms around climate and around gender um, to strengthen the funding mechanisms that already exist at country and global levels and also to, to ensure that that money is going directly to grassroots levels. Um, Furthermore, a key recommendation that we outline both in the United States um, as civil society advocates here and also at the global level is to ensure that 100% of climate financing addresses gender issues and that at least 20% of that goes specifically to gender equality. So we wanna make sure that all climate financing recognizes gender as a key, um, as a key issue and that um, this is recognized both at the multilateral level at the, at the country level and that those recommendations are moving forward. Thank you very much for that. I, I would like, because we're running out of time, unfortunately, again, but uh, I would like to um, ask the last question to, today. And I know there's a lot of questions out there, and I'm sorry that we didn't get to those, but um, I would like to let you know that uh, you can feel free to send them to us, and we will make sure to answer them as best we can um, after this event, and we'll get back to you, hopefully, with the, the answers of those uh, for those questions um, after this event. But um, I would like to um, go to you, Ms. Villasenor, because on your Wikipedia page, I saw that you would like to, you would like to be, you would like to work in the UN, 
right? And, 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 and I would like to ask you, what is it you would like to do? And, and, and in, what, in what capacity? And what would you, what would you like to change? What, what, is, what, are your, what are your demands or what are your, your hopes for the future and, and things that you can change um, from like starting from grassroots activism, but getting into the into the institution um, of everything, and, and how you can change those institutions. What are your What are your hopes? Well, I think the funny thing is, is since I'm so young, I change my mind about what I want to do in the future all the time. <laughs> um, but I do I do remember talking about that particularly one time. Um, I think that one thing that I really like is I like to work on the outside. I think that I'm, I, I like to work outside of the system, but when it comes to the UN, I think that there's so many voices that need to be heard in it, and I think that that's one thing that I really want to do, is I really want to amplify young people and make sure that they get in those rooms and that they have positions uh, inside the United Nations in some, in some form of way. I think one thing, if I could change anything about the United Nations, is that I, think, I wish that things would just move faster. I think that there, right now we have so much that we need to do, and uh, I think that we need to be moving as fast as we possibly can, especially with the tight deadline we're on. So any way that the youth movement can help with that, I'm always trying to push. Thank you very much. I think that is... That is a wish that we all have, that things move faster, and, uh, and I hope that in the future, from the outside or from the inside, you'll be able to make that happen um, with, for these complex decision-making processes. Um, that brings us to the end of our discussion today, um, and thank you so much for, for everything that you've shared and your insights, and, and thank you also to the floor for your interventions. I do not want to let you go, however, um, before, before sharing one more contribution with you, and now the screens have turned off. I hope they turn back on, because we do have another video coming from, um, uh, from, from Japan, from, uh, from um, the minister. Seiko Noda, who, uh, Ambassador, uh, no, it's, I'm sorry, Minister for State and Gender Equality, here we go, Seiko Noda um, from Japan, who cannot be with us today, but in her place, uh, the, the Japanese Ambassador to the United Nations is here, Mr. Tetsuya Kimura. I'm very glad to welcome you. Japan, of course, the next chair of the G7, and uh, uh, if it works, I would like uh, I would, I would like to introduce um, Ms., uh, Minister Seiko Noda, who has prepared this video message for us. And I can hear her, but I cannot see her. Still working on that. Okay.日本の男女共同参画担当大臣の野田聖子です。G7の今年の議長国であるドイツのシュピーゲル大臣をはじめとする政府や国際機関の関係の皆様。市民社会でご活動されているWW7の皆様、そして本日の再度イベントにご参加のすべての皆様のジェンダー平等に向けた取り組みに改めて敬意を表します。また来年の G7議長国を務める日本の担当大臣として本日発言の機会をいただくことを
。2011年には東日本大震災、津波が発生し、死者、行方不明者を合わせて2万2000人を超える大きな被害がもたらされました。その際の教訓も踏まえ、我が国では災害による被害軽減のためにも、男女共同参画の視点に立った取り組みを進めており、2020年にジェンダー平等の実現に向けて策定した国内計画においても災害による被害軽減を重要な柱の一つとしています。また我が国においても環境対策はもはや経済の制約ではなく産業構造や経済社会、人々の暮らしに変革をもたらし大きな成長の機会となるものと認識しています。環境問題に関する施策の企画立案実施にあたっては、男女別データを把握し、女性と男性に与える影響の違いに配慮すること、また、環境に影響を与える政策、方針決定過程に女性の参画を拡大することが重要だと考えています。ジェンダー平等をあらゆる分野において推進することは、日本にとっても、世界全体にとっても必要不可欠です。本年議長国のドイツ、そして世界の皆様とも連携しながら、日本は来年の G7 議長国として、ジェンダー平等の実現に向けて、全力で取り組んでいくことをお誓い申し上げます。ありがとうございました。Thank you very much to the Minister for Gender Equality、um, of Japan, Ms. Seiko Noda, and for her strong commitment to achieve gender equality and to fight for gender equality、um, and, and, as, as Japan takes、uh, the chair of the G7 next year.、Um, thank you very much for that. I would like to give the floor once again to Ms. Yale, Juliane Rosin <laughs> sorry,、um, uh, for some closing remarks. And、um, please go ahead, the floor is yours. I do understand we have very little time, but I want to be quick and、uh, make you understand what we take with us for the ongoing W7 process. We know we need equal and equitable representation of women and girls and all marginalized groups. We understand that we need gender transformative、uh, budgeting, both public and、um, private. We understand nothing goes without data, and this must be、um, dis uh, aggregated, uh, disaggregated data, of course. And when there is a political will, there is a way. I learned that this is a very important proverb. And again, we understand we need to be early, and they need to be concrete and short to have more chances to really、uh, get other people to understand what we are up to.、Um, And I'd like to invite you to stay tuned.、Uh, just take a look at our website,、uh, w7.org, and there are the linkages to all our、um, social media platforms. And just stay tuned. And I'd like to invite you to our virtual summit, which will take place the 24th and 25th of May. So here you are. And please、uh, stay tuned, as I said. And just be sure that、uh, W7 won't、uh, stop working until the end of this year, and we'll make sure that they hand over to Japan as smoothly, and we would like to support you the best way possible.、And And、yeah, I'm looking forward to meet you on the way,、um, both physically and virtually, and to yeah, keep on going, listening to each other and learn from each other. Thank you very much for engaging today. It was really, really important to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Cuisine, for those closing remarks. That brings us to the end of today's discussion. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you could. Take away some inspiration and some ideas on how to progress the women's empowerment in the fight for or against climate change, I should say, of course.、Um, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for,、uh, for listening. I, we, I think we were a little bit longer than we hoped to be, but I think we did pretty good on time. So thank you for bearing with us. Thank you again to the German ambassador, Ms. Antje l e n d e r t z e for opening your house to us and for, for, letting us, for letting us be here and for hosting this beautiful event.、Um, thank you very much to our distinguished panelists for being here, for sharing your insights. And、um, with that, I will send you on your way and we'll hope to see you again soon in person, hopefully, for our next event. Thank you so much. Thank you.